where Quago a stank. Perhaps it wasn't appreciable to humans, but was very apparent to Elishnish. The underground was warm and damp, but one did not become soaked unless they fell into a river or lake. Something about the Mole Beast men disagreed with too much water, and the result of that disagreement suffused the air of their room at the Angel's Rest, their merchant inn. The heating hoop that they had used for their tent now hung on a coat peg. Ilishnish opened their window in an effort to air out the room. Zushiru and his apprentices gathered around a table, looking very much like a group of soaked rats. Master Shiru, one of the younger apprentices said, how long will water continue to pour from the sky? I do not know, Zushiru said. Our driver said maybe a few days. Up until that evening, their journey was accompanied by relatively clear skies. As sunset approached, clouds considered ominous to the caravan staff appeared and swiftly rolled in from the north. Rather than opt to stop less than two hours from the city, the merchants in the caravan unanimously agreed that they should push through the oncoming deluge. They halted briefly, throwing extra tarps over the wagons to protect their goods before the painfully slow race began. Less than two hours became four, and they arrived at a closed gate in the darkness of night. Will we be able to send anything? An apprentice asked, the humans become less when it rains. I saw no demi-humans here, the youngest said. No races that do not mind the wet. The streets were all empty. The humans are all indoors, Zushiru said. We should rest. Perhaps the selling and buying tomorrow will not be so good, but at least we will have our warm tent. This is only one day of many months, it cannot rain every day, I think. Rather than settling into their beds, the five Quagoa collected the pillows, blankets and bedsheets to create a litter on the floor. Then they added the ones that they had brought with them. What's the point of using a merchant in if they're going to sleep as if they're in a stable? Out of the gathered Quagoa bodies, Zushiru's head popped out. Wife, he said, will you join us? I'm not going to bury myself in a pile of wet Quagoa, Ilishnish frowned at the thought. She sat on her stool for a moment, taking inventory of the building through her blind sight. Though the rooms on the second and third floors were hired by members of the caravan, most of them were unoccupied. It appeared that the majority of the patrons were gathered below. Rising from her seat, Ilishnish headed towards the door. I'll be downstairs, she said. Make sure you're ready for work in the morning. Half of the apprentices were already snoring, a wheezing sound that was reminiscent of Quagoa laughter. Ilishnish padded out of the room, slowly making her way to the main floor while she collected as much information as she could. She paused at the top of the stairs until she was satisfied with her various plans of attack and flight mostly flight, should she be caught in an ambush. Many of the men below were not members of the caravan, and they all nursed mugs of ale or lager. Most of the tables had platters upon them, arranged with twists of salted bread, sausages, sliced potatoes and trenches of stew. The tavern's occupants did not focus on their fare, instead occasionally taking bites while engaged deep in conversation. As a whole, the atmosphere was warm and relaxed by human standards. There was even a bard in one of the corners performing a piece she had not heard before. Ilishnish went straight towards the person in the room most familiar to her, weaving her way around the half-filled tables. In an out-of-the-way spot along the wall, three weathered men in similar garb sat on covered barrels around a small table. The one with his back to the wall was Curtis, their wagon driver. To either side of him were fellow teamsters from the caravan. Ilishnish quietly seated herself across from Curtis. Good even. Oi or. Oh. As one, the three men reacted in shock to her friendly greeting. The one on the right jumped up with a shout and the teamster on the left fell off of his barrel. Curtis tried to rise to his feet, but his thighs struck the edge of the table. Ilishnish placed her fingers lightly against its wooden surface to keep everything from flipping into her face. Curtis winced before reseating himself, squeezing his eyes shut and opening them again several times as he looked over at her. D Dame Verilin he said. Where, where did you come from? People at the tables around them looked over at the commotion. It seemed that not a single person had detected her walking amongst them. Now that she was revealed, however, their gazes lingered upon her in the manner that Ilishnish had long become accustomed to. I came from my room upstairs, she replied. There are more people down here than I expected. The men exchanged glances. Emile, the one to her right, spoke into the silence. It's the first big rain of the season, he said, so things are more subdued than usual. Nah, it's more than that, Curtis said. 
Last year, this place would have been packed full, rain or no. Cities hobbled. I was in Collin County till now, Emil said. I heard about it but. Orbit, the dark-haired man to her left, set his mug down with a snort. There's no but about it, he said. A legion's ten thousand men. Now they're gone. Cities lost more than half of its people and half of who's left are out of work. The state of the city and its cause appeared to be the topic at more than three-quarters of the tables. Those discussions either revolved around the changes to trade flows or what appeared to be locals lamenting their situation. There was an undercurrent in the air entirely unlike what she experienced in the merchant inns of the sorcerer's kingdom. The humans here were like prey being stalked and cornered by an enemy that they couldn't escape or retaliate against. What are the local lords doing about it? Ilishnish asked. The local lords? Orbit smirked, the local lords can stop this about as well as they can stop a runaway wagon with their foreheads. Not even a margrave can do anything about an entire army dissolving like that. That fancy academy education doesn't mean shit against this, Curtis agreed. This is violence, pure and simple, no different than a dragon wiping out half the city. Orbit popped a slice of sausage into his mouth with a satisfied look. Amongst their many strange behaviors, humans had a way of lumping their collective ire together and directing it towards the people in power that they didn't like. This was done out of earshot of said people in power, of course. They were equally generous in their praise of those people in power that they did like, even those who did not garner any benefit from their rule. Ilishnish was one of the latter, so, naturally, nothing they said against aristocrats was meant for her. The great house here was attainted, wasn't it? Emil asked. I guess, Orbit shrugged. I don't keep track of how many nobles that bloody emperors added to his tally. Point is that there should be a new margrave appointed to the Katza marches, Emil tapped his finger pointedly on the table. There are all the little nobles working here, too. Hell if I know, Orbit said around a mouthful of potato. Go find a damn noble if you're so worried about it. It sounded like something the Ministry of Transportation would want to know about. Lady Shiltier hadn't instructed her directly on what sort of information she should be collecting, but Lady Wagner had. There was a long list of topics and things to look out for, most of which she had no frame of reference for. She wouldn't be able to make any associations to them even with her notebook listing what they involved. Is there a way to do that? Ilishnish asked. The three men looked up from their meals at her. Finding a noble. I mean. Curtis casually gestured past her with his knife. Half of the locals trading here are likely representatives from companies owned by nobles. I bet you their tongues will start wagging the second you sit down with any of them. I suppose I should give it a try, Ilishnish said. Before she left the table, Ilishnish called a barmaid over and ordered a round of drinks for the three teamsters. She didn't like parting with coins so readily. But Lady Wagner had instructed her to do this whenever people rendered a useful service for her. Rather than find the nearest free merchant to strike up a conversation with, Ilishnish extinguished her presence and settled against an empty stretch of wall. The tavern patrons quickly lost track of her and Ilishnish filtered through their interactions, observing the placement of bodies and items in an effort to discern customs and patterns of behavior. With many finished their meals, conversations had switched from casual chatter to business dealings. The merchants either all knew one another or there was some visible indicator as to what they were interested in. Once in a while, a bargain would be struck. Sometimes, negotiating parties would leave to examine goods or head over to the local merchant guild. A common theme quickly became apparent, the number of locals looking to sell goods far outweighed those looking to buy. Many were attempting to unload the city's surplus on those passing through. Some goods, like rope, fabrics, curatives, certain tools, various parts and foodstuffs, changed hands quickly. Others, such as weapons, armor and magic items, struggled to find any interest. The goods that found their way into the hands of the locals consisted of mostly mundane things like lumber and, no, it was all lumber. Lumber and timber. With the demand for wood used in the construction efforts of the Sorceress Kingdom finally abating somewhat, exports were beginning to undercut the foreign markets nearby. These purchases were made with mixed expressions. With things as they were, people were glad to have cheaper firewood for the winter, but it also spoke of greater changes to come for the region's markets. She noted no merchants looking for precious ores or gemstones, so she wouldn't need to drag Zushiru out of his litter. Two hours later, 
Elishnish was finally confident enough about how things were done. The number of merchants had thinned out in that time and the number of locals that used the location to socialize increased. Elishnish stopped concealing her presence and walked over to a short and rather depressed-looking merchant who remained. The crowd collectively turned their gaze upon her as she went by, and the merchant was no exception. His jaw dropped open when he realized that she was about to take a seat at his table. His breathing quickened and his face grew flushed. Beads of sweat started to appear on his brow. Elishnish hoped that he wouldn't explode. Would it be all right if I made some personal purchases? She asked. Oh oh of course. The man managed to stammer out as he extended a hand, or Snorwell. You are most welcome, Miss Dame Verilin, Elishnish replied, leaning forward to delicately clasp his hand. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mr. Orwell. Elishnish waved over a barmaid, ordering drinks for the two of them. She wasn't sure what she would have, so she ended up requesting the same thing that Curtis had. While she settled into her chair, the merchant's eyes followed her every movement. When they met with hers, he turned his head away with a nervous expression. It's all right, Mr. Orwell, Elishnish smiled slightly. I'm a bard, I won't mind if you look. He only grew more flustered at her reassurance. Elishnish hoped that Curtis was right about being able to gain information. This human only seemed ready to breed. The barmaid returned with two foam top tankards, and Elishnish reached out to cradle one in her hands. You are a dealer in magic items, yes? Why yes, that's right, Mr. Rawwell fingered a pin on his left lapel. Their conveniences, really, surplus items for daily life in the legions. Was there something in particular that you were interested in, Dame Verilin? With the prospect of a sale, the merchant seemed to gather himself somewhat. He sipped at his drink, brushing away the foam from his meticulously trimmed moustache. My party will be on the road for several months, she said, so it occurred to me that I should look into purchasing several things. To begin with, an item for cleaning. Ah, Mr. Orwell brightened. It's the perfect time to look for something like that. He reached out to open a large bag on the seat behind him, producing a white towel. Though it appeared to be made out of wool, it was substantially more valuable to both her draconic senses and her appraisal skills. The merchant unfolded the item, which was roughly 150 centimeters long and 50 centimeters wide. This is a trooper's towel, a magic item that can cast the clean spell three times per day. Does it have any restrictions? Anyone can use it. It's probably one of the most popular magic items in the Imperial Legions. Has a pretty funny story to it, too. What might that be? Well, apparently the man that designed this intended for it to be used as a towel, cleaning up equipment, wiping up messes and such. After it got good and dirty, you'd use the magic on the item to clean it up. Barely anyone uses it that way, though. Then how is it used? People just target what they want to clean and activate the magic. Did that make sense? It probably did. Elishnish had only seen mundane towels and rags used to wipe things up, so the intended usage made the most sense to her. These items should be quite easy to sell, Elishnish noted, the applications are quite broad. You're right about that, Dame Verilin, Mr. Orwell nodded. A lot of people use them, high-class establishments, adventurers, noble households, the problem is that we have a lot of them. They're sold in every city in the Empire and our inventories here were meant to supply the 8th legion. I feel that this is a common thread in this city. The merchant sighed, putting on a helpless smile. Can't be helped, he said. Just need to do what you can. The dissolution of the 7th and 8th legions is certainly a huge problem, but we merchants have always had to deal with unexpected circumstances. What about the people of the Katza marches? Is the administration doing something to adapt to this change? The territories should be fine, Mr. Orwell said. Prices for their goods will shift around a bit, but it's not as if the armies vanished into thin air. There are still all those men and their families somewhere needing to eat, and the markets will adjust accordingly. It's in Gelfort and the towns around here that are bearing the brunt of everything. It isn't as if the Margrave and his nobles are being left to flounder, either. The central administration is working closely with them to make sure things transition as smoothly as possible. It'll probably be tight for a bit, but I'm sure we'll come out of everything in one piece. Elishnish wondered where the man's confidence came from. The trust he expressed was slightly different from that of Lady Zarudnik's subjects. 
Rather than reliance on the local lord, it seemed that the central administration was the recipient of his regard. That's good to hear, Ilishnish said. The atmosphere here seems just a bit grim at times. I won't say that there isn't a lot of uncertainty, the merchant replied. People are allowed to be scared, though. Anyway, orders from up top say that these items are to be liquidated. Towels are going for three gold each to cover our costs, they were six the same time last year. I see, in that case, I'll take ten of them. She reached into her infinite haversack to produce fifteen gold trade coins. According to her information, they were twice the value of Baharuth coinage. Hopefully, she wasn't mistaken. Five of the towels were for Zushiru and his apprentices. She would keep one while Hejinmil would receive another. The rest would be samples for Lady Zaradnik, Lady Shiltia, and Master Tian. Ilishnish placed the coins on the table between them. Now, she said, what else do you have for me? I, I love you, mother. Nemel? What's wrong, dear? Nemel Gran cut off the message spelled before a sob could escape her. As a mage of the Imperial Army, she wasn't supposed to use her mana for personal reasons while on the job. Regenerating mana wasn't like catching one's breath, and her mana consumption was scheduled around its projected use in her duties. Even outside of her duties, she was expected to return to work with a full mana pool. Despite regulations, she had contacted her friends and family while en route to her destination. The flight from our winter to Ingelfort was four hours by Hippogriff, and she had taken the time to settle her personal matters before she arrived. Surely they would allow her this minor indiscretion. They were sacrificing her to a dragon, after all. Nemel miserably hunched over her mount as her hippogriff winged through the slashing torrents of rain. The wind and wet lashed over her and, through her tear-misted flight goggles, she could only see a pitch-dark void that seemed just as bleak as her future. Stupid General Ray and his stupid ambition. Stupid Imperial Air Service. Stupid me for joining it. Now I'm being fed to some dragon like a stupid princess from a stupid minstrel's tale. Except there would be no gallant prince or knight who would come riding to save her. Smart people did not do stupid things like attacking powerful dragons. Even if there were people powerful enough to slay those dragons, they had nothing to do with stupid Nemel Gran. A good, stable, safe job that paid well. Was there such a thing? She had thought so when she signed up for the Imperial Air Service. Back at the academy, the army recruiter told her that chances of being injured in the air were less than being run over by a carriage in our winter, and an aerial mage avoided combat unless carefully calculated support was called for. All she had to do was serve in patrols and cast her spells. She could eat potatoes every day and live in relative comfort. Maybe her family would even give up trying to marry her off. The moment she had received her orders, however, Nemel knew where she had screwed up. Every facet of the Baharuth Empire was steeped in imperial politics. The higher up one was, the worse it got. Whether it was the commoners, merchants, nobles, the military, or the bloody emperor himself, everyone was either a piece or a player or both. Nemel was a new officer in the imperial army. As a noble scion, she understood how the game was played. She was from a minor house and had no connections or wealth. With all this in mind, it was highly likely that she would be used in some power play. General Ray was known for being cold, calculating and ruthless, and now it appeared that his ambition extended beyond the Empire's borders. With Frost 19's itinerary known well in advance, the general had been poised to make a move. Nemel's contact with Frost 19 over the Katsu marches provided him with justification to send her out as an attaché, allowing General Ray to take the reins of the operation. The personal risk that Nemel faced didn't matter, if she was eaten, it was because the Sorceress Kingdom was a nation of monsters and that was that. If she somehow survived, she was duty-bound as a soldier and obligated as a member of the Imperial Establishment to do her best for the Empire. General Ray would of course reap the benefits of any positive outcomes and, with enough exposure, word of his excellent existence might eventually reach important people in the Sorcerer's Kingdom. If there was one way to get ahead in the Empire, it was to get in good with the Sorceress Kingdom. Their nation had to do anything the Sorceress Kingdom told them to, after all. Even so, it took a special kind of brave or stupid to try. Nemel couldn't even be genuinely mad at General Ray. Even if he hadn't sent her, other pawns were most likely on the way from other factions in the Empire. They could come from other parts of the army or one of the more powerful noble houses or some branch of the administration. To be certain, 
having someone from a department like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs take responsibility for an important foreign representative made more sense to Nemel. She tried to imagine those in her class who aspired to a posting with foreign affairs. What would they do if they were flung at a dragon? Instead of finding inspiration from the exercise, Nemel only shrank away from the idea of them getting eaten all the same. It was still pouring when she arrived at the Angelfort aviary. She walked her thoroughly soaked and grouchy hippogriff inside and handed him off to the beast tamer on duty. Nemel glanced nervously about, terrified of spotting a scaly white tail sticking out of one of the stalls. There was nothing of note, so she turned to address the beast tamer. Frost 19 checked in earlier, yeah? Yeah, the beast tamer replied. Less than five hours ago. She looked around her again. Then, where? Dunno, she reported in and left right after that. She, she, does that matter? It probably mattered, but not in the way that people tended to perceive women. The dragon might have wimmelings to feed. Nemel imagined herself being dangled over a nest of hungry ravenous baby dragons like a worm in a robin's beak. Wait a minute, she frowned. Left where? Into the city, probably. What? Nemel scrambled down the stairs. She stopped to address the officer on duty. Where did Frost 19 go? Nemel asked. Well, hello to you too, Officer Gran. Where? The officer leaned back in his chair as Nemel leaned forward over his desk. Droplets stripped off of strands of soaked blonde hair, pattering onto its polished surface. Ah, uh, the angel's rest, I think? Nemel ran out of the office. The Angel's Rest was one of the best merchant inns in the city, located near its central plaza. Through the dark vision conferred by her goggles, she looked for signs of a dragon's passing as she dashed through half-flooded streets. The city blocks looked intact. There were no gouges in the cobblestone roads, no bent and broken magical lamps. She slowed down to examine the front of the merchant guild. There was no sign of any attempt to break in and plunder its vaults. At the late hour, the city's thoroughfares were empty save for members of the watch. She staggered to a halt in front of the angel's rest, chest heaving as she bent over with her hands on her knees. The front of the establishment appeared to be undamaged, with no sign that a dragon had forced its way in. She took a deep breath. Nemel Gran, flinging herself into the dragon's jaws. For the Empire. With that silent and less than half-hearted battle cry, she opened the front door, tentatively poking her head in. Nothing broken, no bloodstains. The tavern was mostly empty, with the staff busy putting away the tables and cleaning the floor. There were a few people who looked like they had too much to drink and an extraordinarily beautiful elf who appeared to be trading with a local merchant. A small pile of gold coins lay between them. Seeing nothing else of note, Nemel walked up to the proprietor who was updating his books at the bar. I require access to the back of your establishment, Nemel told him. The portly man frowned at her demand. As soon as Nemel pointed to her insignia, however, he waved her through. She went across the kitchen and out into the backyard, head swiveling back and forth as she scanned her surroundings. Wagon, 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 no dragon? The stables were full of horses. She hadn't expected a dragon to be in there considering how unbothered the animals appeared to be. Nemel went back and forth in the rain, moving amongst the wagons and checking under them. She looked up at the roof of the inn, just in case. Back in the tavern, Nemel approached the proprietor again. She waved him forward over the counter, speaking in a low voice. Have, have you seen a dragon? The proprietor straightened, frowning at her through his graying beard as if she were a madwoman. Nemel plopped her butt down on the nearest stool, cradling her head in her hands. There's a dragon on the loose in the Empire. They're going to blame me. I'm so dead. My whole family's dead. The Emperor's going to round us up and throw us into the arena to fight monsters. The arena would make a killing. There seemed to be nothing that the people loved more than watching nobles get slaughtered. She cast a haggard look up at the proprietor. I need a drink. Aren't you on duty, officer? Damn it all. The Eighth Legion was long gone and he still acted like there was a base in the city. Nemel placed an elbow on the bar, resting her cheek in hand. Members of the Imperial Air Service were of course, schooled about the threats that they potentially had to deal with. This included dragons. There was the ancient green dragon that lurked in the blister. Frost dragons also inhabited the Azalizia Mountains. There were sea dragons in the Northern Ocean and at least three dragons in Carnassus. 
The Argland Confederation far to the northwest had powerful dragon counselors and an order of dragon knights. Despite the vast majority of people never seeing one in their entire lifetime, the truth was that there were dragons all over the place. And why wouldn't there be? They laid clutches of eggs and became insanely hard to kill after reaching a certain age. Once they grew to that point, they just existed forever doing whatever they did. Dragons were a race whose numbers slowly accrued over time. Since it was probably for the best that they remained out of everyone's hair, the Imperial Air Service had a fairly simple rule when it came to dealing with dragons, don't piss them off. Sure, the best of the Empire's fighting forces could deal with adult dragons, assuming they were dumb enough to stay on the ground, which they probably weren't, but an ancient dragon could guarantee the end of the entire Empire. She idly scanned the tavern again. Dragons were known to be cunning and some might be exceptionally skilled at stealth and subterfuge. Could it be that she was simply beyond Nemel's meager ability to detect? It wasn't as if she was a ranger or a rogue. Nemel Gran was just a wizard, like every Gran who came before her. Several of the staff were trying to get all of the drunk patrons out. The elf looked like she was just about done dealing with the merchant. Thank you for your patronage, Dame Verilin, the merchant said in a voice that was far too jovial for the late hour. I will have your order prepared by tomorrow morning. He. <laughs> That elf is a knight? It's been a pleasure doing business with you, Mr. Orwell, Dame Verilin replied with a warm smile. I look forward to seeing how everything works out. She has a beautiful voice, too. Some women just get everything. Why is there an elf here anyway? Most of the elves in the Empire were imported as slaves from the Theocracy. This elf clearly wasn't a slave, neither was she a wood elf from Evansa. She didn't even know what sort of elf she was. Furthermore, the Empire wasn't very receptive to non-humans despite legally allowing them passage and residence. The only exception to this was for the dwarves from the Azalizia Mountains. The merchant pulled a cowl over his head before disappearing into the rain outside. With that, all that was left was the elf, the tavern staff and some stubborn drunks. To Nemel's surprise, the elf came over to join her. Good evening. Good evening. Despite herself, Nemel's upbringing had her straightened to make a polite reply. Damn it, why is everything about her beautiful? Is it magic? Some kind of enchantment? The elf's silver eyes glimmered at her over a set of exotic features that seemed sharp, yet soft at the same time. From beneath the waves of her silky, frost-blue hair, ears that Nemel decided were rather short for an elf poked out. They were only a few centimeters longer than the chopped-off ears of elf slaves that Nemel found so painful to look at. She was tall, slender and elegant, moving with inhuman grace. Her luxurious outfit was reminiscent of a dress uniform, making her look every bit the knight that the merchant made her out to be. An impossibly fantastic knight from a minstrel's tale stood before her. Could she save Nemel from a dragon? It's been a week since we've last seen one another, Dame Verilin said. Are you all right? You don't look very well. Huh? I, uh, I apologize for my rudeness but I cannot seem to recall our meeting before. You're the mage from that patrol last week, yes? Either that, or there is someone who looks exactly like you. Patrol, last week? Highway patrols flew over thousands of merchants and travelers every week. As distinct as the elf's appearance was, Nemel wouldn't have taken any particular note of her, even through her magical goggles. Aerial patrols focused on detecting threats to traffic and rural settlements, as well as coordinating with ground forces in the territory. There was also the fact that most people on the ground wouldn't notice an air patrol thousands of meters above their heads, or even think to look. Highway patrols didn't conceal themselves as potential miscreants actually looking out for them would be deterred from their activities, but it would still take an individual with substantial detection abilities to notice them casually. She couldn't discern people's strength at a glance like the Imperial Army's scouts, but there was not even the slightest sense of personal power radiating from the elf at all. Yes, it was just over the border to the southwest of here. Nemel's eyes slowly grew wide as what the elf was saying slowly sunk in. Dame Verilin could only be referring to one thing. Did that frost dragon have a rider? There was no way to tell from below. No, if Dame Verilin was the rider then she would have seen the frost dragon in the aviary or during her panicked search. She glanced over at the inn's proprietor, but the man had disappeared somewhere. It's late, Dame Verilin looked across at Nemel with her arresting gaze. Perhaps you're tired? Humans usually rest at night. I'm exhausted no, 
I mean, I'm Nemo Gran, an officer with the Imperial Air Service. I've been sent as a liaison, or an attaché? A anyway, I look forward to working with you, Dame Verilin. She lowered her head unsteadily. Did she screw up? Going by how the merchant was treating her, Dame Verilin was a knight, a bona fide I have a thief knight, not the type of honorary knight found in the Imperial Army. Should Nemel have instead introduced herself as a member of the nobility? It was more correct to introduce herself as a member of the Imperial Air Service, but aristocrats varied widely in what they considered significant. Sometimes, introducing oneself professionally would have one treated with the respect accorded to the institution they represented. Other times, they were dismissed as a rank-and-file nobody. I see, Dame Verilin smiled. In that case, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Officer Nemel Gran. Eh? I'm saved? Was I worrying over nothing? Since we'll be together for the next little while, Dame Verilin extended a slender hand, please come and join me in my room. I would very much like to get to know you more intimately. Before she could think about what was being said, Nemel placed her hand in Dame Verilin's. The Dragon Knight led her gently up the stairs. Nemel followed without resistance, a stupid smile on her face. Wait. What are eight? Wait. What's going on? If one were to ask Nemel whether she preferred men or women, she would have answered men without a moment's hesitation. The elf holding her hand, however, was so supernaturally attractive that anyone would easily and happily fall for her. Looking up at the elf no, dragon, Nemel sighed in helpless resignation. She was going to be eaten, after all. Nemel barely lasted a half hour. The dragon was simply insatiable. Nemel was helpless, she could only respond to Dame Verilin's thorough exploration. The frost dragon in elf form did not show even the slightest sign of fatigue, but Nemel was thankfully released with that same, enchanting smile that had captured her from the moment they had met. Nemel wobbled over to her bed, but sleep was not so easy to achieve despite the night's ordeals. One might have surmised that it was because she was sharing a room with a dragon, but it was actually because they were sharing a suite with five giant rats. She hated rats. So long as there was food and a place to hide, they somehow materialized like creatures conjured on demand by the world itself. They were dirty and left droppings everywhere. They made unsettling noises unseen and could appear anywhere. They got into the stores and devoured her precious potatoes. This hatred for rats was to the degree that the very first spell she had learned was Magic Arrow at the age of eight. Magic Arrow flew unerringly to its target, passing harmlessly through any obstacles to deal enough force damage to kill the disgusting rodents. It was the perfect spell to slay rats, and Nemel Gran transformed into the fearsome arcanist who defended the grounds of Gran Manor. Her valor was to the degree that she had even impressed her childhood friend, a boy that she still fancied to this day. They had attended the Imperial Magic Academy together, though he had enlisted with the Imperial Army's ground forces with aspirations to knighthood. Still, her ability to obliterate the filthy rodents brought little comfort, there were always more, more than a little girl had mana to deal with. It was a battle that she could never truly win, and eventually, they would have their revenge. As a child, no, even now, she imagined them sneaking into her blankets and nibbling away her ears and toes and fingertips while she slept. Once, after a particularly terrifying nightmare where she fought against an endless tide of giant vermin in the dark places of the city, Nemel had awakened with a scream and ran tearfully to her father. When Lord Gran had finally coaxed an explanation out of her, he gave his youngest daughter the most incredulous look and shouted absurd. It's not absurd, father. They're real. This was her final thought before her eyes closed to the sound of the dragon's beautiful voice. Another voice stirred her from her sleep. Wife, there is a human in my bed. MHM. Why is there a human in my bed? Because she walked over and fell asleep upon it. Nemel opened a cranky eye and immediately regretted it. Not ten centimeters from her face was a nose with twitching whiskers and a face full of big, pointy teeth. She leapt up onto the mattress with a shriek and pointed a finger. Magica. Dame Verilin gently took Nemel's hand in hers. Good morning, Nemel. And just like that, her spell was interrupted. Still, Nemel calmed at the sight of Dame Verilin's warm smile. Good, good morning. Did you rest well? Dame Verilin asked. I was perhaps a bit demanding of you last night. If it is required, you may rest a while longer. And no, it's fine. I. 
Now more aware of her surroundings, she noticed the overcast skies through the window. What time is it? It is three hours after dawn, Dame Verilin replied. The early morning markets should be closing now, so Master Sheru's apprentices should be readying his stand for the day. Nemel usually rose before dawn. Highway patrols started about an hour before traffic started moving, so she had to ready herself quite early. She had retired late last night and she had woken up even later. Her sleep had been strangely restful as well, with giant rats on the floor beside the bed, there was no way that could happen. Unless. She frowned, trying to recall what happened. The last thing she remembered was the comforting caress of the dragon's voice. Did you put me to sleep? Nemel asked. You seem to be having trouble, Dame Verilin answered, so I decided to lend you some assistance. But that's. Illegal. It was technically an attack. By Imperial law, she could face a hefty fine for assaulting an officer of the Imperial Air Service. If it was unwelcome, I apologize. It wasn't exactly unwelcome, Nemel withdrew her hand, but it would be proper to ask first. Thank you, though, it really did help. I see. Dame Verilin turned around to usher the giant rat away, whose name was supposed to be something like Zuchi Rudash and Nemel stepped down off of the bed, looking around for a mirror. The room did not appear to have one, but she found a trooper's towel folded on the table. She looked over at Dame Verilin. Did you leave this out for me? You may use it if you wish. As she fixed up her uniform, Nemel slowly digested the meaning behind their exchange. She was a noble, a wizard, and a soldier and she discerned many veiled messages in the Frost Dragon's words and actions. Nemel thought herself a fundamentally good person. She liked to believe in people, liked to think well of those with whom she interacted. If it was up to her, she would give everyone the benefit of the doubt. She knew better than that, but she still wanted the world to be a better place than it was. An Imperial aristocrat could not afford this kind of thinking. Neither could a member of the Imperial Air Service. Every day, her work revealed people for what they were. Many would lie if they thought it would benefit them in some way. Some would do anything if they thought they could get away with it. Every time she was called in by ground patrols to inspect a wagon or investigate a group of travelers, the story tended to be the same. They feigned ignorance, pretending innocence before the ground patrols composed of regular infantry and scouts. Then they saw her hippogriff descending and she could see their masks break as they realized that their bluff had been called, that a mage armed with the spells required to inspect their manifests was on her way. One that could dispel their flimsy attempts at deception and communicate with distant authorities to investigate their identities and activities. Nemel knew that most people were fine, that the ground forces only called down an air patrol if they had good reason to suspect and expend mana to confirm those suspicions, but she still felt sad every time it happened. Sad and disappointed. Despite the politics and scheming of those with power, the Empire was a good place for its citizens. The Imperial administration worked hard to make it work. As did the Imperial Army, the ministries and all of the other institutions. People worked hard and if only the few bad apples would make an honest effort, the Empire would be an even better place. As such, Nemel wanted to believe that Dame Verilin was a good person. She was a knight who was gentle, beautiful and kind, just like the ones from the minstrel's tales. It was true that she had broken the law, but she had done so with benevolent intent. It might have even been because she was from a place that had adopted the laws of Rias ties. Everyone, be they members of the academy, the army, or the nobility, was disparaging of the kingdom on the other side of the Azalizia mountains. Her instructors would always say things like their nobles can't even tell the difference between a flare spell and a fireball but was that even possible? Surely not. The Imperial Magic Academy tried to instill their students with a sense of pride in the Empire, but Nemel didn't think that it was nice to tear others down simply to prop oneself up. The Empire had plenty of real achievements to be proud of. Dragons were known to be wise, powerful creatures who used magic as simply as breathing, so that might have been the reason. Something like sleep magic to knock out Nemel Grang was probably child's play to a dragon strong enough to wipe out the entire Imperial Air Service. This thought brought her to the other, darker side of things that she didn't like. Everything that day in Verilin did could be interpreted as an exercise of power. She was an official from the Sorceress Kingdom, a nation of monsters ruled by an undead sovereign. Nemel had heard the stories of the Sorcerer King and his spell that had massacred the poor royal army of Reistais. 
That same sorcerer king then went to fight the martial lord in the R Winter Arena and won. He was an arcane caster just like her, damn it. The emperor had capitulated shortly after, and now the empire was a client state. The sorcerer king and his representatives were absolute, this was a matter of imperial law. A commoner might turn around and say Dame Verilin isn't representing the sorcerer king but it didn't work that way. In any nation, an official was an individual invested with certain powers. Those powers ultimately stemmed from the head of state or governing body, so an official of the sorceress kingdom represented the power of the sorcerer king. It was not a relationship that any noble in their right mind would take lightly. Dame Verilin might have broken the law to see what the Empire would do about it, and Nemel didn't know what the correct answer was. If Nemel didn't arrest her, it would make the Empire look weak. Not weak in terms of de facto power, but weak in the sense that they would be seen as a nation that did not possess the will to uphold its own laws. It would be a blow to Imperial prestige and the Empire would fall in the Sorceress Kingdom's estimation. If Nemel did try to arrest her, Dame Verilin might transform into a frost dragon right inside the room saying ho, it seems the Empire doesn't take its subservience seriously and fly off to destroy the entire nation. Dragons were known for their pride and it was entirely possible. Nemel Gran would be responsible for the destruction of the Baharuth Empire and the death of over 8 million innocent souls. This was too big for her. What did General Ray expect her to do? Well, no, that much was obvious. The general wanted to ingratiate himself with the Sorceress Kingdom, and he expected Nemel to do her part. If the Sorceress Kingdom's representative had been a man, General Ray would have even ordered her to go so far as to seduce the representative and get herself pregnant with his children to create a tangible connection. Children with a monster. Could that even happen? Not that it mattered. She would be told to try and try and try again until she was ruined and discarded. Nemel had no way to resist. House Grang was a minor house and they couldn't depose an imperial general. She didn't have any powerful allies to rely on. Many of her classmates were already maneuvering themselves under one faction or the other, but Nemel disliked intrigue and thought to stay out of any power struggles if possible. The only way to win the game was to not play, she thought, but, as she was finding out right now, all that did was make her powerless. Fine, be that way. I might not like it, but I can play that game. Too. General Ray probably thought her the perfect pawn, noble born with no connections of note. But he had screwed up. There was a connection right in front of her, one more powerful than anything in the Baharuth Empire. She finished fixing up her appearance and turned to Dame Verilin with the perfect poise of an imperial noble. Dame Verilin, Nemel said, would you like to continue from where we left off last night? That would be wonderful, Dame Verilin replied, but it will have to wait. There's a whole day of work ahead of us. Of course, Nemel nodded. Might I ask where we are headed? The Market Plaza in the southeastern quarter. The Forge Plaza, but why? In this region of the world, the wind blew from north to south. Thus, every city had industrial quarters somewhere on its southern end. Nemel recalled the stated purpose of Dame Verilin's visit. The more she thought about it, the more suspicious it seemed. There was no reason for a dragon to be interested in logistics, economies and all that. Also, the Sorceress Kingdom was so unfathomably powerful that the Empire's meager offerings would hardly be of note. The powerful preferred agents who were attentive, discerning and discreet. It wouldn't do for Nemel to keep asking questions. For now, Dame Verilin appeared to have accepted her as the attaché that General Ray had dispatched to attend to her. She could figure out what was really going on as time passed and she proved her worth. She followed Dame Verilin and the Ratman down the stairs and out of the inn. Puddles covered the streets of Ingelfort, but the rains had subsided to a bare drizzle. Things were as busy as one could expect out of a city that had been stripped of half of its livelihood, and the chilly weather made the citizens' movements brisk. A half dozen steps down the street, Dame Verilin held out her hand. Nemel stared down at it uncomprehendingly. You'll lose track of me otherwise, the Dragon Knight explained. Also, I believe you have an invisibility item. I do, Nemel replied, but why? Were they already on their way to spy on something? She wasn't sure how far she could go with this. I would like to observe the people of this city and their usual behavior, Dame Verilin said, but this is decidedly difficult when the entire street is staring at me. I will be concealing my presence and you will look very strange holding your hand with nothing. Did that make any sense? Maybe it did. 
She was a foreign agent that needed to learn the behavior of the locals so she could blend in, but if she could already conceal herself she could find out anything she wanted and go anywhere she pleased. Nemo resisted the urge to scratch her head in confusion. She was a wizard, not a spy. The closest thing to spying that she did was cast divination school spells. She gripped Dame Verilin's hand tightly and activated her invisibility cloak. They slowed their pace until they trailed ten meters behind the rat van. Passersby gave the demi-human a wide berth while eyeing him curiously. Is she seeing how people react to demi-humans? Checking what sort of reception the Sorceress Kingdom's minions will be exposed to by using this one as a test subject? Was that a mean thing to do? No, they were probably working together. The rat man didn't seem to defer to Dame Verilin at all, so maybe he was a knight, too. A rat man knight. Or maybe a rat man lord? They continued southwards. Nemel found herself praying that nothing bad would happen to the rat man even though she hated rats. Her nervousness rose whenever they passed a night patrol. Some of the men she knew as she often stayed at the Angelfort garrison while going back and forth on her patrols over the Katza marches. Knights on garrison duty were civil enough, but would that civility extend to non-humans? It wasn't as if non-humans were prohibited from being in the Empire, but they still weren't treated the same way that humans were. That he was a race unknown to the city was fortunate since it probably earned him more curiosity than anything else, if he were a goblin or a skeleton wandering the streets, the knights would have definitely attacked. Fortunately, they made it to the plaza without incident. He came up to the stand where his fellows were working. Master Shiru, one of them asked, where is your wife? Eh? Master Shiru spun around, his beady eyes looking every which way. Dame Verilin released Nemel's hand and the rat man turned towards them. She is right here? Master Shiru said. She was not here when you arrived, the apprentice told him. Do not be silly, Master Shiru waved a paw, she has been with me the whole time. Nemel glanced at Dame Verilin. Rather than saying anything or putting on some innocent expression, the dragon walked away and started to circle the tent behind the stand. Nemel stepped quickly to catch up to her. What's going on now? She asked. I am making sure the tent is set up properly and the surroundings are secure. Was there something important in the tent? The stand appeared to have precious ores and gemstones on display, as well as mineral reagents for alchemy and enchanting. It was honestly a nice setup, highly visible with a touch of class that managed to not be out of place for a market in an industrial quarter. There was a degree of comfort to it that made other merchants at their stalls look on with envy. The only problem was that it was being run by Ratman. Any interest that the stall attracted was immediately cancelled out by faces that still made Nemel itch to smack them with a shoe. When Dame Verilin finished her inspection, she seemed to collect herself. Nemel tensed. It appeared that her real work was about to begin. 